بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم و رحمت الله و برکاتو so thanks a lot from uh, Al Mahdi Institute uh, for inviting me to this uh, wonderful event so the topic of my uh, presentation as you see is free speech and critic of religion in contemporary Islam uh, so the introduction it means that the uh, article of uh, uh, Universal Declaration of uh, Human Rights on Freedom of exp Expression and Religious Freedom are considered as the discipline of the reasonable people, Siratul Ogala, in our time. I do not read the other details uh, because of the time, and I focus only on one issue, critic of uh, religion. Uh, these are the six sections of my presentation today. I highlighted the major points and I try to uh, 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 discuss these details that were highlighted. Yes, please. Uh, and two things that I use a lot in this presentation two documents, two human rights documents. The, the first one is a 1966 International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, that ICCPR. And the second one is 1990 Cairo Declaration on Human Rights in Islam, CDHRI. And you can see uh, the uh, those articles that are related to our discussion today. Uh, and I do not read it also, but I will return to them uh, several times. And the second one is so important for us. Uh, I think this is the manifestation of conservative Islam today. They are so close to each other. And when we talked in international area, always or usually we are understand in this way as it's presented in Cairo Declaration. Because of it, I chose it. And section one of my presentation is decriminalization of apostasy and blasphemy. So according to UDHR, Article 18 explicitly and ICCPR that I introduced it, Article 18, Paragraph 1, changing religion or belief is not only a crime, but also is an essential part of religious freedom. But in Islamic document of human rights, CDHRI Article 10 prohibited any compulsion or exploitation in conversion from Islam, but it does not condemn the same techniques in conversion to Islam. While apostasy is a crime in traditional Sharia, the explicit framework of CDHRI with severe punishments, neither these punishments are removed nor apostasy is decriminalized in CDHRI. The best sources of criminalization of apostasy in Sunni and Shiite Islam, I use them, but I do not uh, every time they refer to them, do not mention their names. In Sunni Islam, Al-Fiqh al-Islami wa Adillatuhu wa Dr. Wahbad Duhayli. And on Shia Islam is Mawsuat al-Fiqh al-Islami tibqan li madhhab ahl al-bayt. The Encyclopedia of Islamic Jurisprudence according to, to the doctrine of the household of the Prophet. So these are especially the entry of the apostasy in the second one is so important for us today. And this is criminalization of apostasy in Shiite fair in that source that I mentioned. I do not want to read the details. You can see everything here. And when we want to talk about the freedom of expression, this is the image that everyone in the world understand from us as Muslims, as Shiite. I do not want to read it. And also about criminalization of blasphemy in conservative fair. 
you can see that what we have in international documents and what we have in uh, conservative Islam documents, Sunni legal schools, you can see what happened there. And from Shiites, in that source that I mentioned, the jurists have reached a consensus that blasphemy, sabullah, sabur rasul, or sab of one of the imams of Shiites is apostasy and the person is considered mahduruddam, a guilty person whose blood may be shed with impunity. So it means that blasphemy, as also it was mentioned in, this, in the same source, that blasphemy of Hazrat Fatima Zahra, the Prophet's daughter, and other prophets is attached to apostasy. And as you see, a, a, executing a blasphemer does not require the ruler's permission. Everyone out of the court can do it according to fiqh, Muslim fiqh, Shiite, and Sunni. So from a reformist Islam, that is my viewpoint here, there is no reliable proof from the Quran, Sunnah, consensus, or reason that can establish the validity of executing anyone accused of apostasy or blasphemy of the prophet. And you can see the other details. For this important claim or statement, I have seven proofs. And the, you can see these proofs here, one to three. I do not have time to explain each of them. And in Q&A, if you have any question, I will uh, try to answer that uh, these are because uh, I pub uh, published them about uh, a decade ago and I have new points related to this uh, workshop today. I do not want to spend my time on these issues. You can read them and the books were published in Persian and also English. So these are four to seven and I think we can remove and we can we can remove the punishments or decriminalize uh, apostasy and also blasphemy according to one or more of these seven proofs. And I think they are strong. We can talk about them later. This, these are not the subject of my presentation today. So the principles of freedom of speech in Islam the major point is the right to life has no relationship to one's belief. Religion is a matter of the heart and personal choice. And you can see that the claim of religious freedom and freedom of speech of those who did not decriminalize apostasy and blasphemy is baseless and unacceptable. It means that in this workshop, everyone wants to talk about these two rights that are essential, but that this person does not accept the criminalization of apostasy and blasphemy. I think this is the playing with the words. This is baseless and unacceptable. This is the major claim of my presentation today. Section two, uh, this is critic of Islam in Muslim majority countries and Muslim minorities. So you know that we have about 56 uh, major Muslim countries and in other countries we are in minorities. So critic of Islam is possible in, in both situations. Conservative Muslims do not when they want to talk about critic of Islam. In Muslim majority countries, they do not be a critic of Islam and take it as enmity or plot for weakening or removing Islam. But reformist Muslims uh, not only do not fear critic of Islam, but also believe that such critics strengthen the Muslims in a competition with the other cultures and traditions on one hand, and manifests, manifests the advantages of Islam, eliminates the probable weaknesses of the religious knowledge on the other hand. My point here is the first one. The first is even 
if the critics of Islam are harmful, critics of Islam are harmful, that we understand it, but it is impossible to prevent them in the time of internet and satellite. It means we should pay attention to this impossibility. And in the second point, the Muslims who live in open societies without any restrictions of critic of Islam are the better and more up-to-date believers in the case of defense of their faith in the modern time than the Muslims who live in the closed societies. It means if our concern, if our purpose is defense of our faith, which of these societies, open or closed, is better for our purpose? But critic of Islam is permissible with no difference between two situations of Muslims in majority and minority, according to reformist Islam. But as I mentioned, conservative Muslims use a double standard uh, criteria. They use it when they are in majority, they do not use it when they are in majority, but when they are in minority, they use the benefit of freedom of expressions. And this is this double standard approach is questionable. Section three, critic of Islam by non-Muslims and Muslims. So by non-Muslims is usually justified as the religious hostility that is predictable. So this is, we do not have talk about it a lot, but critic of Islam by a Muslim, that is the case of my presentation today, is divided to at least three types. The first type easily could be attributed to misunderstanding or deviation of Muslims action from the standards of Islam. This type of critics has been tolerated without any difficulty. In my paper, I gave a lot of examples for each of them. The second type is the critic of superstitions or local custom, hijaz customs, or understanding of past juries or abrogated or time-bounded rulings that are considered as Islam. So if it's the case of the critic of Islam, I think, uh, this is the job of the ulama to purify Islam with the superstitions or other issues, and they uh, demonstrate, they uh, present the real Islam. Many of conservatives or ultra conservative ulama and their followers resisted on their fanatic understanding and do not listen to the reformist ulama. So we have, it means that we have two different interpretations of Islam according to this type of critic. The freedom of expression requires us to tolerate both of them, not one, not only reformists, not only conservatives. This is the meaning of, I think, freedom of expression. But the most important point is the third type of critic of Islam, that we have a lot of problem with this type. This is really critic of God, critic of his prophet, critic the Quran, Critic the Shiite Imams by a Muslim, not by a non-Muslim, by a Muslim. What should we do with these critics of Islam? These critics are the signs of inconsistency with Islamic faith, according to the mainstream of Islamic thought. We can criticize these statements and argued that they are wrong and could not be introduced as Islamic teaching on one hand, and give evidence for inconsistency of them with Islamic teachings on the other hand. But we are not allowed to call critics as non-Muslims until he or she introduces himself or herself as Muslim. The only judge for the claim of Islam is God in the hereafter. We are in charge of accepting the appearance of people in the matter of faith and religion. We should tolerate dissidence, innovation, new ideas, or critique of Islam. These viewpoints 
I mean in I mean the third type of critique of Islam. That is the harshest critique that we can imagine. Even when we are sure that they are wrong, their error, their mistake are not crimes and their producers are not punished. This is, I think, the major requirement of freedom of expression. Section four, a scholarly critique of Islam versus non-scholarly criticism. So, although most of the non-scholarly criticism of Islam are baseless, irrational, or hedonism, but we cannot ignore the impact and the importance of them in mass media, social network, satellites, and internet in the modern period. I confess that many of these critics are organized to shape Islamophobia and are affected that mentality of the Western audiences about Islam. The influence of these critics of Islam on Muslim masses are undeniable. But what can we do? Banning them is not possible. Issuing fatwa of prohibition, tahrim, of reading or re uh, listening or watching these is not effective. Sentencing the producers to severe punishment is not the solution. Should acknowledge that the non scholarly critic of Islam in the modern period as unpleasant reality. We should respond to these critics scholarly in a language, in a way that is understandable by the masses. These productions will start competing with those critics and uh, the, those critics and non scholarly defamation of Islam. This is a competition. We should uh, start competing in this way. But on the other hand, a, scholar, a scholarly critic of Islam, that is the, I think the one of the major purposes of this workshop. A scholarly, a scholarly critic of Islam has a rich record in life the experience of Muslims. Alhamdulillah, there was not any red lines for a scholarly critics in traditional seminaries. I found several examples of this wonderful record of Muslims in my paper. I do not have time to uh, mention one by one, despite some of its tragic exceptions about mystics, about some philosophers, about some dissident fuqaha. The scholarly critic of Islam has been the best example of freedom of expression among Muslims. It has been continued by present, alhamdulillah. So, section five, critic of Islam in public for the masses versus critic in closed circles. Closed, uh, closed non-academic circles are somehow tolerated, not because of its theoretical permission in conservative Islam, but because of difficulty or even impossibility of monitoring such circles. Imagining the low influence on masses, these circles are ignored by ulama or Islamic states. Conservative Islam requires hard restrictions in public. And this is the case that we should talk a lot about this case. The connect the concern is not shaking the face of people due to weak public information. This concern is thoughtful one, especially when we know that many of these suspicions or dubious issues about Islam are organized and Islamophobia is a political agenda in post-colonial period. We should pay attention to this background of them. But modern technology, especially internet and satellite, negates the possibility of restriction of a public sphere. This is a very important point that we should keep in our mind. Freedom of expression 
in Muslim majority countries does not mean preaching atheism or anti-Islam or distributing propaganda against Islam. This is the, I think, concern of many conservative Muslims. But it means that these ideas could be broadcasted in private media or could be taught or discussed in private academic centers. Discussing these issues in public media, academies and research centers will then in the framework of law. I want to mention to one of the major figures of freedom of expression of Islam in contemporary, I think, time. Murtaza Mutahari, as you can see his image here. This is the uh, direct translation of what he said a few weeks, a few weeks before his assassination. In that the book, as you can see, the future of Islamic Republic of Iran. I advise the users and the proponents of Islam do not imagine that the way of protection of Islam is negation of freedom of expression. Islamic beliefs and Islamic philosophy are not preserved with letting not the others to express their ideas. No, let them talk. Do not let them to betray. Keep in your mind, the Islam could not be guarded by preventing of the others to express their thoughts and beliefs. The only way that we can guard Islam is logic regarding freedom of expression and encountering opposite thoughts explicitly, frankly, and clearly. This is, I think, the very clear statement of our philosopher, our theologian, our jurist. I have one comment, a brief comment, on what Mutahari may mention in his last point. Do not let them to try. Does it mean that ulama or Muslim governments should examine each speaker before expressing his or her ideas and be sure that there is no betrayal? If so, practically it opens the arbitrary restriction of freedom of expression in the name of prevention of betrayal. This is not acceptable. The last point in this section, freedom of expression in public and private is the best way of spreading Islam and strengthening Islamic thought. Freedom of expression provides a competitive sphere and the winners will be those who are stronger in logic, theoretical knowledge, practical dialogue, and convincing the people. I should highlight this point, censorship, banning the medias, restriction or violation of freedom of speech are not the solution. The last section, freedom of expression and blasphemy. I think this is the controversial subject. Does freedom of expression includes blasphemy? Many believers, including Muslims, distinguish perfect full critic of Islam on one hand from defamation of Islam and insulting or cursing or mocking the prophet, his household and his companions on the other hand. The UDHR and 1966 ICCPR UN documents, which recognize freedom of expression, define it, define its domain to respect of the rights or reputations of the others and the protection of national security or public order or public health, health or morals. You cannot see anything about religion here. The clause deals with violation of the rights of individuals and not rights of the recognized for religions or followers of religions. Insulting individual can be a crime, but insulting the religious beliefs of individuals in these documents 
is not considered a crime in principle. We should understand it for those who live in the West. This is the problem. The argumentation based on hate speech for excluding blasphemy, blasphemy from freedom of expression in the framework of United Nations documents is not acceptable. It means those friends that try to find some way through hate speech, be careful. It does not work in this framework, framework of United Nations document. What should we do? Practically, also the Muslims main purpose has been rejection or banning the blasphemy, mockery or insulting prophet or Islam in the West that the Muslims are in minority. They cannot do anything practically. They cannot do anything. No one listened to them. I highlighted this sad point. In the Muslim minority countries, the blasphemy laws are often used by governments to support, to suppress unorthodox religious views or opponents of the government and they're the guys of prote protecting religion. Theoretically, defamation of Islam and insulting or cursing or mocking the prophet, his whole soul, his household, Ahlul Bayt, intentionally, in my understanding, is a sin. And ethically, is forced to blame that penalizing these actions or utterances and the labor of blasphemy are problematic. The Quran does not criminalize blasphemy. The hadith of considering the blasphemers as mahdur them are invalid for several reasons. I mentioned all of these reasons in my article. Severe punishments for blasphemy is wahnul Islam. Implementing the punishment would impair or delete uh, the Islam, light civil punishment could be implemented in developing countries to prepare for absolute decriminalization of blasphemy. And my final points, final words. Islamic jurisprudence should be revisited, revisited in the light of freedom of expression and religious freedom. The ground, the tradition, the tradition of other prophets and other imams support these two rights strongly. This revisiting is return to Islamic standards, Islamic values. The problem of freedom of expression is less jurisprudential or fiqhi and more related to the mabadil fiqh or pre-jurisprudential principles, such as anthropology, criminology, international criminal law, critical thinking, and history that could be called the requirement of the time and place. Free speech and the limits of expression is one of the new problems in contemporary Islam. Do not think that you can solve this problem in traditional fair. And its subject is new, completely new. Those who cannot understand this new subject could not, they cannot solve this problem. So this is my presentation. And thank you so much for your patience. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.